So welcome back everybody to another class on optical methods for solid and fluid mechanics. So what we are going to look at today is the image processing uh, preliminaries that are required for this particular course. Uh, but just to quick recap, we were looking into uh, various functions like the autocorrelation function and the covariance function last time and I wanted to give you these two uh, references if you wanted to look them up. Uh, the first book uh, discusses probability models, uh, so it will deal with things like expectations and the idea of a probability density function or a probability mass function and if you are not familiar with them, this is one possible uh, book that you can take a look at. There are many good textbooks, this is definitely not the only one, uh, but this is a book that I have and uh, it is uh, it's a good, uh, it is proven to be a good material book for me. Um, another book could be uh, for the uh, topics of covariance and autocorrelation and how they behave uh, and how to deduce them from let us say time series or uh, series data. The, this is a very nice book, uh, Introduction to Time Series and Forecasting uh, by Brockwell and Davis. This is a Springer Verlag publication. The previous one is a Harcourt India Private Limited publication. Uh, Sheldon Ross was the author for the previous book and uh, these are the two authors for this particular book. As the name suggests, uh, this uh, book also deals with forecasting. So, if you are uh, interested in things like that in un understanding um, uh, trends for example, in time series data, uh, this could prove to be a good book. Okay. So, but uh, for us uh, this, uh, we are just looking at preliminaries and this is not a very detailed uh, dive into these mathematical methods. So, we are not going to dive too deep for that. We are just trying to make sure that you have enough uh, introduction to some of the functions that we are going to use in the image processing uh, subsequently, right. Okay. So, with that uh, I think one of the most important cornerstones of this course will be image processing and uh, we should understand why that is. So, before uh, uh, we go into some image processing preliminaries, I wanted to show you some examples that you might come across in your type of work. So, for example, this is a video and I will quickly explain what you are going to see here. Um, this is um, a sub micron particle, okay, uh, sub micron particle in a liquid environment. Uh, being seen, uh, being seen, seen using an optical microscope. And actually, we use phase contrast optical microscopy for this. So, this is a phase contrast imaging. It is a very particular type of optical imaging. And here uh, what the particle is doing is the particle is stuck in an optical trap. So, it is sort of a particle tra trapped in a well and it is going to exhibit Brownian motion uh, around uh, the center of the well. And uh, from here you can actually, uh, if you can see this image is very pixelized because uh, the particle is very small and we have to uh, look at the, the task that uh, we had was to look at the center of this particle as it moves. Right? So, I will just play this video, we are not going to go through uh, the technique right now, but I am just trying to uh, give you an idea of the kind of uh, things you might encounter. So, you can see this particle is vibrating, right? it is a very short video, sorry, okay. So, you can see that the particle is vibrating and uh, the center of the particle is, is moving a few pixels on this side and that is because it is stuck in a uh, in an, uh, potential well. The potential well is actually created by using an optical tweezer and uh, I hope uh, maybe perhaps uh, optical tweezer is a very interesting technology if you want to look it up. Uh, there was a Nobel, a couple of Nobel prizes for using optical tweezers. Um, now, this particle as it moves, the whole idea is to look at the center of the particle and, and uh, use this, the sequence. so the video is basically nothing but a whole set of images that are put together uh, and uh, you can analyze each image to see where the center of the particle is and you can uh, measure the Brownian motion of the particle. 
the measure of the Brownian motion of the particle in this particular case, uh, it actually gives you an idea of the strength of the optical or the potential well or the optical tweezer in this case. So, uh, uh, an example of using uh, image processing to uh, quantify uh, certain uh, physical parameters, right. Another example uh, was, uh, so you have seen this video before, but I still wanted to show it again. Uh, these are all, the, there is a la green laser light that is coming from the side, it is coming like this, uh, green laser sheet. And these are your uh, tracer particles. The tracer particles are actually not green, but they are reflecting green light. So, they appear green here and as the fluid moves, uh, you can see this fluid be behavior, right. You can see how the fluids are moving and it is possible to get very quantitative oil area and velocity fields from this kind of data. So, you can actually get uh, what we had talked about the oil area and uh, velocity fields. by analyzing such videos and uh, we will be in the first part of the course we will be looking at fluid flow. So, we are be uh, really concerned with the oil area and velocity fields for our case. Uh, so, here you are not going to we are not going to be tracking individual particles. You can see the difference between this uh, uh, example and the previous example. The previous example you only had one particle that was moving around and you had to the, the task at hand is to uh, observe how it is moving. Uh, in, uh, in the different frames and where it is. So, it is actually locating a single particle. Whereas, uh, when we have to analyze the fluid flow in this particular case, we are not going to be uh, analyzing each and every single or uh, motion of each and every single particle. Okay. So, here this is a slightly different type of image processing that is required. Uh, this uh, is another uh, work, uh, one of our students in our lab was doing it. I will quickly explain what you are going to see in this particular video. So, what we have is uh, this from the side view if you want to see, we have a petri dish. Petri dish is full of water and a drop of water is going to come and impact it from the top. Okay. Now, the water is colorless and, uh, and transparent totally. So, the when the uh, the particle hits, what it does is it it creates uh, uh, these waves uh, as uh, when the so it will create these waves when the the f the the droplet has hit the fluid surface, and these waves uh, are not easily visible because uh, the water is colorless and transparent. So what we have done here is we have put a sheet at the bottom which has a certain type of a pattern, which is what you are seeing here. This this is the pattern, for example. Uh, that we are seeing. So, there is a sheet at the bottom um, we, on which a particular type of pattern is printed and there is a light source, this is a diffuse light source at the back. So, there is a, there is a, so that we have light coming equally from all sources, so diffuse light source. Okay. Um, so, I am going to uh, play this video and so, we, by the way, we are looking from the top, okay. So, this is the side view and this is actually the top view, sorry, uh, top. So, I hope you could uh, see the, the wave. Now, the, one of the reasons you are able to see the, the wave is for example, if you see here is the wave, right? It is very easy to understand where it is intuitively. Uh, why? Because the, all the particles here, they are appearing distorted. Here there is no distortion in this region. Uh, okay. So, I pause the video here for a very specific reason is that is because, uh, okay, let me play it again and try to pause it again. Okay. Uh, well, let me Okay, I am being a bit slow. Okay, now, so uh, 
this, uh, so you can see that there is a wave front right here because there is a lot of distortion that is happening in this region, right. So you can see that these particles are distorted whereas here where the wave has already passed, uh, here there is no more distortion. So you can observe part, uh, the, the wave front and you can see there is a wave here. Now this distortion is smaller than uh, the distortion let us say uh, in this region or, or elsewhere. So it also tells you uh, where the wave is uh, amplitude is higher or lower from this. So uh, this requires a d slightly different type of image processing in order to if you were uh, trying to locate the wave front as a function of time you could do this with this kind of a image sequence also. So what I basically did is I showed you three different examples uh, all of which concern fluid mechanical phenomena. Uh, the first one uh, concerned Brownian motion, there is a single particle which is moving and exhibiting Brownian motion. The second one uh, there is a, a bulk flow in a fluid and the third one which involves uh, a wave on a, on a fluid uh, body. So all these require image processing in order for us to understand or uh, uh, quantify these things. So unless we understand more about images, uh, okay, we'll I will uh, switch over now to my notes. Uh, so unless we understand uh, the intricacies of image processing, it is going to be difficult for us to uh, appreciate uh, how to do these, uh, how to apply these image processing tools. So a necessary precursor to, uh, to quantifying the fluid mechanical phenomena is to understand image processing basics. So Again, as I said, uh, this class is not going to go into a whole lot of detail about each and every aspect of this, uh, the preliminaries that are required, but we want to give you enough insight so that uh, you are not uh, left hanging up there, out there, right. So uh, now overall, uh, our idea here is we are going to be doing some kind of a measurement, okay, uh, measurement using optics. This is our basic idea. Now in order to do that what we have is let us say we have uh, object of interest okay. So I am just going to draw a person here stick diagram and let us say this uh, is object of interest is my fluid in this case and uh, you are trying to observe that. Now the way you are going to observe is going to be there is going to be a camera somewhere right. So you will put a camera and it is not going to be a great diagram okay I am just uh, drawing. Uh, some, uh, um, so this is your object of interest. This is my camera or recording device. So some kind of a recording device has to be there. The most common recording device for us will be the camera. So that is why I am just going to write camera slash recording device. Now uh, how are you going to, um, how is this light going to come? So some light is uh, from these. Uh, from the object of interest is going to come and hit your camera and get recorded there. But in between it is probably going to pass some lenses right or some kind of an optical train which may be a lens system or something. So let us we will say that there is uh, it could be a simple lens, it could be a compound lens, it could be something else. So you will have an optical system uh, most likely a series of lenses that will be there, right. And then you are going to have uh, some kind of a light uh, that is going to be interacting uh, and uh, with the object of interest going to pass through my optical system and finally reach my camera. So, uh, so this is uh, this is uh, this indicates uh, light object interaction. A good question here uh, to ask would be, where does this light come from? Okay. Um, so this is a question. 
I'm not going to answer this question right now. Uh, I'm going to first talk about the imaging portion, and then I'll come back to uh, uh, w where this light comes from. There can be many different ways in which this can happen, and each imaging pr uh, system, imaging process or system can have. Uh, its own uh, way in which this light comes and this light object interaction uh, what uh, what does this mean so these are good questions uh, we are going to leave that for right now we are just going to assume that s some uh, of this happens and then light comes and gets uh, recorded on uh, my camera or the recording device okay so we are just going to assume that and essentially the result is that you have these photons that are there right so these photons are going to come and hit your camera and end result of all this is uh, is that the light end result for us is that this the the photons uh, or light gets converted to electrons in my recording device or the camera and this electrons finally are uh, stored as some dig integer or digital value in the recording device itself okay so uh, so what happens is now uh, my electrons are going to be converted and remember this is what is going to comprise my image okay this set of uh, uh, digital values this is my image so what we do is uh, your image value okay the value that you uh, Im image value uh, the data that you are recording is basically proportional to the intensity of light it may not always be proportional and we will see that image processing can uh, may render this uh, no, uh, n be to be a non-linear function but usually it is a monotonic function so your higher image value represents a higher amount of light it may not always be proportional but for simple systems uh, so I will just have the caveat if the uh, relationship is linear then the proportionality holds which means that the image value should be equal to the uh, the proportional to the Im intensity of light received at that now my camera or, or, the, or uh, my uh, recording device uh, again uh, recording device i'm just going to uh, mean camera in all our cases okay so that's what we are going to use but i say recording devices to for a slightly more general purpose so we have a set array of pixels on my camera right so my camera is essentially nothing but an array of pixels where my electrons, uh, my light comes and hits and this uh, gets uh, uh, converted into electrons and some value is recorded here, right. So this is uh, some value, some value gets recorded here. Now assuming this uh, monotonic uh, nature of uh, image value a value of 0 basically means that there is no photons that have been recorded. So uh, the lowest value that can be recorded uh, is 0 right. So my i minimum is equal to 0 and this is usually um, interpreted to mean a black pixel okay so the pl pixel so your computer will display if the value is zero or below a certain threshold uh, it will display a black pixel then but the question is what is the maximum value that can be stored uh, now this depends upon actually the way the image is stored um, so if we assume uh, so now you have to decide how many bits are being uh, spared for storing each so every data here uh, in this pixel uh, needs a, 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 a bit to be stored right so if this were a 8 bit image which means 8 bits were uh, available to it to store the value 
then the maximum value that can be stored is actually 2 to the power 8 minus 1 which is actually 255. So, this is the highest value that can be uh, stored for 8 bit, but if it is not a 8 bit, if it is a 16 bit then obviously this number changes and this becomes 2 to the power 16 minus 1. Now, many of the uh, images that we are going to deal with 8 bits are more going to be more than sufficient. So, from here onwards we are just going to assume that all the images are 8 bit. Okay, so, for our purposes they are, you can always go for higher bits uh, 16 bit also, 32 bit also. Uh, the, um, uh, the amount of uh, extra information uh, that comes out uh, with versus the uh, the data storage requirement they do not pan out that well 8 bits are usually more than sufficient for us. Now, what happens if you are, uh, so some I some high current ok, so let us say some uh, uh, high current uh, becomes uh, I max in your camera. Okay, so, this is your current, uh, okay, maybe I should use um, different notations here, okay, wait a second. So, okay, um, okay I will just use J for current, okay. Okay, so this is J is my current or my amount of uh, uh, charge that is flow created because of the photon sitting and this i is the uh, the value stored in the pixel okay. now my if my j if the current if the number of photons that hit are more than uh, some j high this is let's say a uh, uh, threshold that you have defined so where j high is a predefined threshold. Then my i that is stored is equal to i max because your bit cannot hold more than that. Okay. So, uh, this effect is also often called uh, pixel saturation. And for our case, we should will try to avoid this. Um, this should be avoided. And also, uh, one more thing to note is usually there are thresholds. Uh, usually, there are thresholds for both the minimum and maximum value. And maximum value and max values. Uh, by which, what we mean is that uh, there will be some sort of a current value uh, below which, if you, if the current is below the certain threshold, then you will store the value zero there. Okay, so uh, the value zero doesn't mean zero current in that sense. So it just means that you have defined a threshold and. Uh, the number of photons falling on it is small enough to not register a high enough current you end up getting a zero value on the pixel and similarly for the max ok. So, uh, so now, um, now that we understand what, uh, so ok, one more quick thing before I move on to uh, uh, images uh, used in scientific uh, cameras, uh, in an RGB image ok. where the words are R uh, stands for red, uh, G stands for green and B stands for blue. Uh, for every pixel, three values uh, are recorded. So, if you have an RGB camera or a color camera um, and if it is uh, a color camera, if it is storing images in an RGB format, you have to figure out what your uh, 
uh, how your chip is storing the image it could be uh, some other form also CMYK etc other formats also exist. But for the our case we will just assume that color, uh, color photographs imply an RGB image. If that is the case uh, then uh, for every pixel you actually uh, uh, note 3 values okay? and uh, the first value will correspond to R, the second value will correspond to G and the uh, the third uh, value will correspond to blue. So, basically in a color image. so a color image uh, is essentially a m cross n cross 3 matrix where m comma n are number of pixels uh, in the two directions. So, if your chip is such, so let us say this is your chip and it is made out of these things called pixels where these boxes are basically pixels. Okay? So, this is a pixel and this is let us say this is m, this is n. Uh, so, then you have uh, every image is m cross n, but if it is a color uh, image, then you have 3 such uh, 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 matrices, right? So the first corresponding to uh, R, so this is uh, color R and this will be your uh, uh, green and this will be your blue. But this gives you a very good idea of what uh, image uh, usually comprises of. Right. So, we have been discussing images and this overview should just going to add a page here just a second. My mouse is frozen for some reason. Okay. Yeah, now. Okay. Um, so, uh, usually scientific cameras are monochrome, not always, but often. Okay. And uh, why they are monochrome uh, we will discuss when we are discussing uh, the impact of light and the lenses and everything uh, usually, but again it is there is no uh, hard and fast rule there it all it basically depends upon uh, the system. Uh, many a times um, there is no need for 3 matrices a, a grayscale image is good enough. So, if you have a grayscale image what you have, uh, so to summarize so a grayscale image let us call it I is basically a matrix with m into n entries. Right, where uh, so you basically have a matrix, you have m uh, uh, columns and uh, rows, and you will have for every place you will have some value that is being stored. Right, so some some value that is going on. So here uh, some some value that is being recorded. Now this value is what we just discussed that. Right, so this value uh, is a minimum of zero or maximum of 255 or basically basically any integer between uh, 0 and 255. So, an integer between 0 and 255. So, it can take on both values 0 and 255, but it is usually some number in between, right. And this is what a grayscale image uh, which is a, an 8 bit image will comprise of, okay. So, uh, let us do one thing here. I am going to show you, okay. So, now what I am going to do is I am going to uh, so, when you have a image uh, that is being displayed on your computer, usually you will see an image rendering which is your computer's rendering of that. 
but in reality uh, as you now know it is just composed of some integers uh, stored in a matrix format. So, uh, you would as a scientist you would want to be able to access those numbers and that is the key you want if you want to start playing around with images you want to be able to access those this matrix and you want to start playing around with this matrix. And, uh, uh, for you to be able to do that you have to know how to how to access or how to understand what values are being stored. Now, what I am going to do here is I am going to show you using a free software called ImageJ. Now, this software is uh, uh, is freely available for download for uh, various uh, operating systems. So, what I uh, urge you to do is just go ahead and try to get this software. So, if I go here and I say about image J, it tells you that this is image J uh, 1.53 T and these are the contributors and uh, it is available at this uh, uh, location and uh, image J is in the public domain. Now, this uh, so in order to understand uh, 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 or follow through. Uh, this next tutorial what I will uh, ask you or urge you to do is to go ahead and download image for yourself uh, irrespective of what operating system you have you should be able to find uh, uh, a release version that is appropriate for you and then um, I will try to show you uh, how this works. So, what I am going to do is I am going to uh, use that image uh, that we had uh, we have seen before right uh, this image you remember. I was telling about the Orion uh, nebula which I imaged this is my photograph uh, that I have taken with uh, one astro club member here. And I am going to show you uh, how uh, image J works. So, what I have done is I have opened this uh, 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 image in, in this particular software and I am going to show you a few things uh, how it works uh, in this particular context. So, uh, before that uh, we will end this lecture here and in the next class I will show you some uh, image processing basics. So, uh, in the meantime I urge you to go ahead and get this software for yourself if you want to uh, look, uh, look around with me ok great. Uh, I will stop here today. Thank you.